Celebrating the written word, this is the County Writes, the County Reads, with Lynn Pickering on 99.3 County FM. Welcome to the show. You may know today's guest as co-host and producer of CKWS-TV's Global News Morning Kingston. Or if you're of a certain generation, you'll remember him for his years as a VJ at Much Music and Much More Music throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s. Now, Bill Walichka has written his autobiography, which not only features many of the stars and legendary performers he's interviewed over the years, but reveals his personal journey, overcoming stuttering, defeating depression. His book is titled A Happy Has Been, Exciting Times and Lessons Learned by One of Canada's Foremost Entertainment Journalists. Welcome to the County Rights of County Reads, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. Such an honor. Now, normally I ask authors to read a short excerpt from their book, but in this case, I ask somebody else to read. Bill Wilichka, what to say? He's a great guy, obviously, anyone can see that, whether you're watching him interviewing someone or you're talking to him on the street. He actually always looked to us like a guy that could have gone to our high school. They kind of had the same hair as me, too. We in the hip never wanted to do interviews, like, ever. We looked at it as a chore and an extreme chance to embarrass yourself. So we always did the same thing. Short straw had to do it, and then we'd take turns after that. But Bill was a revelation to us. He was super friendly, a kind smile and vibe, yet he asked questions that kind of woke you up and made you realize you'd better up your game and stay on the ball. He was that good, and his questions were always interesting and usually fun. He made you feel really good, special, safe. You felt like you were talking to a buddy, one who was very interested in you and your band in a very personal way. His long and curly locks continued to be a signature for him back then. And come to think of it, he was actually close to being as cute as Erica M at times. Quite an achievement. Gord Downey and I lived beside each other in Toronto in those days, and I actually remember the two of us walking home from much music after an interview with Bill and agreeing that he was a cool cat and a great interviewer. Of course, we said he looks a little too much like us, but we'll forgive him for that because he's really good at what he does. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone in music that Bill hasn't interviewed. He's rubbed shoulders with Madonna, Cher, Kiss, Michael Jackson, David Bowie, and Prince, just to name a few. But from personal experience, he doesn't bring it up or brag about it. You kind of have to dig it out of him. And when you do ask, what was Bowie like? He always has an interesting and highly respectful answer highly unique life he's had for sure after such an illustrious career in tv and radio and all other kinds of media bill eventually settled here in kingston in 2012 and our hometown has been so very lucky for that he's immersed himself in everything here he currently has a great morning time show and interviews everybody who's got anything going on and to this very day he does so much for our community, like constantly. You'll see him everywhere, especially at events designed to raise money for those in need. He looks for places to help and he finds them. He's leveraged his celebrity status to help all kinds of charities and individuals here. And just as importantly, he's lent his emceeing talents to numerous charitable causes countless times. From what I know, Bill's mom, Barb, instilled in him a sense of importance of charity and of community. And Bill uses these inherited gifts on the daily as he gives graciously so much of his time to great causes. And he also quietly supports events financially behind the scenes that he's already lending his talents to. He's a gem. I know this to be true. He sort of likes me, which I think makes me like him even more. <laughs> You'll enjoy taking this very special journey with Bill, I promise. And so will I. That, of course, is Paul Langwa of The Tragically Hip, and he's reading the foreword to A Happy Has Been. Pretty nice words from Paul. Beautiful. Um, I'm welling up again. Um, it's done through Zoom, so it's video. I don't know if you can see how I read my eyes are. And I can see. up a little. I, uh, it's like being at your own funeral and hearing the nice speeches that people give <laughs> or something. <laughs> What a thrill, what an honor. Um, when I asked Paul to do it late last year, Paul Langwa to write the forward, I thought he'd be busy. He's a busy guy. He was just coming off of recording a brand new record. And he got back to me and said, yeah, he'd be honored to do it. And I thought, wow, so cool. 
I had to turn the book into the, uh, excuse me, I'm welling up a little. I had to turn the book into the publisher and uh, let him know that, oh, the uh, forward is due. Sent him an email. He got back to me. He goes, well, I'm in Costa Rica right now with Joanne, his wife. And uh, he said, yeah, give me a few days. And I got it. He sent me the email a couple of days later. And I read it. And I shared it with Amanda. And we both looked at each other and just said, how sweet and wonderful is Paul Langlois? And you can extend that to the rest of the guys in the band. And what a surprise. Thank you so much for that. Well, I have to tell you that, of course, I don't know Paul, but I messaged him on Facebook. Immediately, they messaged back. Yes, he's happy to do that. About five minutes later, another message. He's recording it now. And then about 10 minutes later, it's in my email. The kind of guy he is. I know. Um, and him and Joe make a perfect team in that uh, simply more than just asking him to write a forward or you to record his voice, to read the forward that he wrote, they've spent a lot of their lives really elevating this city. And his work in the hip have elevated Canadians on so many levels, not just music and inspiring so many years of beautiful sediments within all of us, um, but also with charities across Canada. And they do it in a quiet way. They don't jump up and down about raising millions and millions of dollars across this across this country, and especially within our region here in Eastern Ontario, stuff for hospitals and for care hubs and, oh, so many organizations over the years. And uh, this is one of the many reasons why I love the band, one of many reasons why I love Paul and Joanne. I want to talk about your relationship and friendship with the Tragically Hip a little later, but let's go to the beginning of your book. You moved around as a boy and a teenager. What are your memories of that time of your life? I remember when the family was together. Um, some of the older siblings had already moved on, but uh, growing up in Welland, um, a lot of the older brothers uh, had problems with uh, authority and um they all had records except my next older brother police records they were in jail in and out of jail three older brothers were my mom thought before i got uh, to a certain age her and my dad were splitting up and she wanted a clean slate with her life and took me my next older brother with her we moved to richmond hill she was a school teacher got a job and so basically my mom raised me from the fourth grade on as a as a solo parent and I think I benefited greatly looking back at my life and just looking back at going through school and going through high school and um, you know realizing that I was instilled a lot of feminine qualities female traits and I have no problem admitting that we look at what women have to offer it's a sense of nurturing and sensitivity and compassion, empathy, sympathy. I think are largely feminine qualities. Um, it's just what I've been exposed to and no problem admitting that. And I think if more guys did admit that and more guys took on those feminine qualities and those, those beautiful characteristics that a lot of women are capable of, we'd have a lot less problems in the world. And I have no problem admitting that. So yeah, that's going back to the early days. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you talk about my older brothers being in and out of jail. My mom wanting to pull me out of that environment at an early age. I would sneak into their rooms and listen to all their older records when they were at home, staring at album covers, examining photos and reading the liner notes. And just became with not just how music sounded and what it did for me, even in kindergarten, uh, but how it was packaged and how it was presented and just what it could do to someone's spirit. And that is elevate them and make them feel good and move them, make them dance, uh, mm -hmm. make them remember things. And that's the power of music. And I've always carried that with me and I still do. Man, you're, you're going to make me cry again. This is one of the most, I've done about 35, 40 interviews the past month and a half. And this has been the most emotional. <laughs> We've just begun. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. This might make you cry, too. I'm sure many readers would be surprised to learn that you stuttered as a youngster. 
How did that affect you? And how did you overcome it? I don't think I really noticed it. I know I had some uh, older brothers that stuttered. And I don't know, I've never done a lot of research into the reasons why or it's hereditary, you know, perhaps there's a hereditary nature. My parents didn't stutter, uh, but two older brothers did, fascinatingly enough. And it didn't really bother me until someone would bring it up or someone would mimic me at recess in grade school or something. The biggest problem that I had was answering a telephone as a teenager. Teenagers love to talk on the phone. And the biggest problem that I had is... A, if the phone would ring, I would pick it up and it developed into a stammer where I couldn't say hello. And it would be like, hello? And by the time you finally got out the word, someone on the other end is going, hello, is anyone there? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit embarrassing that way or picking up the phone to call someone is David there. Is David there? Is, you know, there'd be that pause, there'd be that, that fight to get it out. I realized in college, I've wanted to go to school to learn how to shoot, you know, with the video camera. I went to a radio and television course in Toronto at Seneca College, it was a two year course, fell in love with editing, that's a whole other story. But in the process, you know, you're doing assignments for class, you're in other people's assignments, you're doing news reads. I just kicked my ass one day and said, get over it, but just, talk. Uh, I didn't read any books on how to overcome it, but it was part of my life up until up until college. To this day, it happens every now and then. No one notices it. And uh, to this day, it, I still deal with a little bit of a stammer where if I'm trying to speak, it's there's a bit of a pause. Well, you mentioned college and a quote from your book, College introduced me to yet another genre of music I really hadn't been exposed to before, and it would alter my life forever. Talk about that genre and how it changed your life. At that point, um, you know, I was a huge fan. Uh, and music has always been a badge to me. You know, in high school, if I'm a, if I loved Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and Led Zeppelin, I had a jean jacket with the patches on my back or buttons. Uh, music always important to me and uh at around college i was right into alternative music the cure Bauhaus, violent femmes um just you know old rem for instance and uh i had met this guy in college his name was paul and we both had a radio show on the campus and his show was after mine and i'd stick around i'd talk with him and listen to his music and all he did was country this would have been 86 and that was the year of debut records by randy travis steve Earl, and dwight yoakam so country to me might have been alternative none of my friends listened to it it was just something that i've never been exposed to fell in love with each individual style of country that these artists were mining the veins of Dwight Yoakam had a real throwback take to his country where he brought it up to date into this new 90s sort of or this 80s Nashville or LA production actually and uh, you know very reminiscent of Hank Williams, Lefty Frizzell, like those old cats and Steve Earle had a little bit of uh, an outlaw sound to his country music, a little bit of Waylon Jennings thrown in there maybe some Merle Haggard and Randy Travis had a little bit of a take on his country music, very sort of AC almost. Uh, and I became a big country fan, did my homework, fell in love, went back, listened to George Jones and Waylon Jennings, Merle Haggard, and Johnny Cash. Uh, a lot of those old cats that I considered legends now, Conway Twitty and just fell in love with country music. And when, um, I ended up graduating, starting at Much Music as an editor the same week I graduated. I was so lucky, very fortunate. I submitted a proposal on Much for a country show. What Part of my job at Much in those days was to take the one-inch videotape reels from the record companies and dub them for Much Music's library. And then the record companies would pick up those master tapes again. We had all these country music videos coming in and they weren't being played on Much and I submitted a proposal for a country show. One ended up going on the air and I ended up working on that show until I ended up eventually hosting it. So yeah, country music, I would say in a lot of ways sort of 
changed my life. One of the cool things about being someone who loves music so much and discovering a new genre, for instance, or a new artist, is you don't stop liking that. You know, so I, I won't say, oh, I don't like country music anymore. No, I still love country. There's a certain period where I stopped listening to new artists. But as far as that love of those legends, uh, I still carry that with me. And it's like hip hop, rap music. I never really liked hip hop or rap until I first heard Public Enemy, um, very militant group. And I got what it was all about one day. I just woke up and I said, okay, I understand Public Enemy now. I get it. And then you enjoy LL Cool J and Ice-T and Beastie Boys and what they brought to the hip hop world. And so, yeah, this whole mirage, this whole myriad of music and all these artists that I've grown up enjoying and liking and to this day still finding out new music sticks with you you don't stop liking a certain band or a song and it just it, the the love of the genres and the music just keeps growing and growing and piling up and piling up as you get older well in the next segment we're going to talk about a few of the artists that you've interviewed but I just want to end this one by jumping ahead to, and having you explain how you came to be one of much music and much more music's most popular VJs. Um, yeah, I fell into the on-air stuff, like I said. Um, they ended up canceling the country show because uh, CMT started up in Canada. And they thought a 90-minute weekly show on much music, how can that compete with a whole new specialized country music network? So when they dropped it, I thought, well, it was a fun ride um, back to the Edit Bay. Although I never really left the Edit Bay, even during my early on-air stuff with Much, I was always producing, always editing. And Denise Donlin, the director of music programming at the time, says, Bill, we're moving you over to regular flow VJ. And I said, uh, can I still do my editing, though? <laughs> I love that. She went, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you'll just do the... Either look at it as you're an editor with doing VJing on the side, or you're a much music VJ now, and you can do your editing and producing on the side. It's up to you. So uh, it's the the best of both worlds for me. Um, I was never the cute one or the political one or the wacky one on much. I realized well, you, sure look, come on, Gail, you sure look like the cute one with all that long curly hair. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you, I guess. I had to cut it at some point. It's costing me a fortune in hair products. I was losing a lot of money. You know, I realized different VJs had sort of different personas or what. And I was just a guy that loved television, loved doing music interviews and loved creating television. I think that was my persona, if anything. I knew a lot about all kinds of music. And so I think that's what you saw when you watch much music is this guy that loved music. And there he is interviewing his favorite artist. How cool is that? You're listening to The County Writes, The County Reads. I'm Lynn Pickering, and my guest today is Bill Wolitchkoff, author of A Happy Has Been, with the subtitle, Exciting Times and Lessons Learned by One of Canada's Foremost Entertainment Journalists. So, Bill, let's talk about some of those exciting times. I'm just going to mention a few names, and you can tell me about your experiences with them, okay? Uh, let's have fun. Go ahead. Okay. Brian Wilson. If people sort of, why does that name sound familiar? basically the brainchild of the Beach Boys. And the cool thing about Much, of course, there was a lot of traveling. I was in LA or New York every couple of weekends, back and forth, international trips. And there was one trip specifically to LA uh, for Madonna. That was another story. But part of that four or five days in LA was uh, Warner Music was with us, Warner Music Canada, the record company. And we uh, had to go interview Brian Wilson at his house. Uh, it was a gated community, as you would expect, and uh, we got there, and Brian Wilson, for years, I don't know what you would call it, I don't think it was mental health issues, or maybe you can, but one of these guys you really didn't get a lot of in terms of interviews over the years, over the decades. There were some affectations I think a lot of people thought he might have, and Man, it was a great interview. We were in his house, in his living room for like 45 minutes. There was no weirdness going on. His wife was gracious, a beautiful home. And at the end of the interview, while the cameraman was packing up uh, the lights and the gear, Brian Wilson just walked over to his piano and just started playing. And I realized how rare of an opportunity this would be for anyone, you know, let alone being a fan of Brian Wilson and his songwriting and his producing and the Beach Boys, that's something else. That's cool. But to be 
allowed into the home of one of rock's biggest visionaries and influences and getting a little private concert i realized i have the luckiest job in the world the reason i want to ask you about that is because of the gift that you gave the bare naked ladies and the reason i'm asking about that is because kevin hearn is going to be in the county on september 25th at the region theater for a screening of There Are No Fakes, and that's the Truth and Reconciliation screening series at the region. So I know that you gave each of them something. Oh, good for Kevin. Boy, you know, everyone has a story, and I'll talk about that later, but man, that guy's got a great story too. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I, the, part of that LA trip with Madonna and Brian Wilson assignments, um, the next day, I think, I, I think it was the next day, we had to drive to the Hollywood Hills, and uh, be on set for a music video that the Bare Naked Ladies were shooting. But they did that amazing song called Brian Wilson. Don't think they had met Brian at that point. But before the trip, I grabbed five Brian Wilson 8 by 10 glossy pictures. And so after the Brian Wilson interview, I asked him to sign it for each individual band member. And he had heard the song and he loved it and he had heard of the band. Anyway, presenting the band with five individual personalized autographs from Brian Wilson the next day. I just thought it would be a, a fun touch to catch up with these hardworking Canadians who are now touring in the U.S. and working hard in the U.S. Yeah. A nice little gift to take home with them. Yep. And I think they eventually met Brian over the years, so they didn't have to ask for his autograph. I already took care of that for them. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Madonna. Tell me about Madonna on that trip. One of many interviews, I was actually a little intimidated before uh, actually meeting her. Um, I've seen some interviews with her over the years where I don't know if challenging is the right word, but you have to you have to go toe to toe with her, I think, before she respects you as an interviewer or if she likes your questions and then she'll give you stuff. This wasn't an actual interview with Madonna when we went to her house. Uh, I would eventually interview her a year or two later, and it was a great interview and a fun time with Madonna. And But we were there to present her with the trophy for the Much Music Video Awards, Best International Video, I think it was. So I was given this one prototype, this one trophy, to take down and tape an acceptance speech from her that we could run during the live broadcast of the Much Music Video Awards which was a live broadcast, but then they would go to this tape with the winner, Madonna, and then we'd run that tape of her saying, thank you, here's my award. But it was like a com comedy of errors that afternoon. Um, I felt like one of the three stooges um, running around, bumping into the other guys. It was just, what basically happened is we got there, made introductions to our assistant, ended up in the living room, beautiful room with lots of art. And her assistant said, okay, um, I'll bring her in in a few moments, get set up. So our cameraman, Steve, uh, was setting up the lights and the camera. And when Madonna came in, we made our introductions. And I said, yeah, we can get you to stand here. It's a nice background, some art in the background. Here's the award. And basically say, hi, I'm Madonna. Thanks for... And she went, wait, 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 hold on a second. Where's the monitor? Uh, I went, huh, sorry, what? She went, I, I need to see the shot. Uh, where's the monitor the tv screen i have to look at the shot before i start i'm not shooting anything unless i see what i look like in the shot and i look at steve our other steve he's the record company rep from canada and he went no one told me you needed a monitor and she went well i don't work without a monitor can you get a monitor and she's looking at me like i'm responsible and i says well we are in hollywood um i'm sure there's enough production houses in town she goes okay well there's the phone book uh, there's the phone and uh, gentlemen, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Uh -oh. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> and so anyway, that yeah, opened up the phone book, audio visual. Okay. Audio visual equipment, rentals, monitors. Um, the assistant came back, said, boys, how's it going? What's going on here? Uh, did you find a monitor? And we said, yep, one is on its way. It's going to be delivered. Uh, sure enough, 20 minutes later, uh, the guys buzzed up through the long driveway. Madonna, at that point, her bung it was like a sprawling bungalow near, in the Hollywood Hills. So you can see like the Hollywood sign very close by. I went out to grab the monitor. Steve, the record company guy, was taking care of the paperwork. And uh, I grabbed the monitor. 
I started carrying it inside, went into the den. Behind me, I hear, wow, this is a nice house. Who lives here? And it's the <laughs> delivery guy of the monitor, the audiovisual guy. I said, no, man, you can't, you can't be here. You have to leave. Sorry. And then Steve Waxman, the record company guy, came running in the house afterwards saying, sir, sorry, you can't come in here. And the guy goes, what are you shooting in here? Is this a porno? Can I watch? <laughs> like, no, it's not. Just please leave. Anyway, the guy's waiting outside. Paperwork was taken care of. Madonna comes in. This is a long story. I said, sorry. <laughs> we go to start shooting. She approved the shot. As we start to record, the light bulb on top of the light stand goes out. She goes, well, did you guys bring a light bulb? And <laughs> Steve Gelder, the cameraman, goes, yes, I, ha I have one of those. Put the camera on the ground, lower the light stand, change the light bulb, put the light stand back up, picked up the camera, says, okay, we're ready. And she goes, okay, great. In three, two. And as she's starting talking, the light stand clamp wasn't tight enough, and the light is moving down slowly and slowly and slowly and she goes oh geez and i i'm apologize at this point i'm holding the monitor so she can see it it's a, it's a wonder is, she even won let you interview her again <laughs> i would have kicked us out at the beginning and i'm holding the monitor and it's getting heavy i'm just holding it this whole time and uh he fixed the clamp on the light stand uh oh she knocked it off in one take thank you and i asked to have i had to get the trophy back it was the only well i found that the one. funniest i found that the funniest part where you had to take the trophy back because it wasn't the real one and i said sorry uh this is just a prototype <laughs> one will be sent to you you'll get it eventually she goes ah oh, don't bother here I go, <laughs> you don't you don't want your award and she went yeah. nah, look around what am i going to do with them i like art trophies are and awards are tacky and I was looking around, I go, yeah, I don't see any. Where are your Grammys and your American Music Awards and all of those trophies? She goes, they're in a box under the stairs somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's go on to David Bowie. Yeah, another artist that I was in grade one when I discovered Bowie, my older brother's album collections, and just one of these cats that uh, you know comes with so much respect with his name just because of what he did and how he did it and what he represented. And that is, uh, he didn't have a, a single canvas. He created characters. He created sounds, his work with Brian Eno, avant-garde producer, very groundbreaking. And he was always moving, always changing direction and never stagnating. Interviewed him a few times. And always a great interview. But again, one of these guys that when you've seen some interviews, he can be challenging. He can be uh, not in a bad mood, but if you can't go toe to toe with him, he won't really give you the time of day. And lucky and fortunate enough that any interview I had with David Bowie was brilliant. And it always would make its way into an hour special that I was working on yeah. for something. And uh yeah, Bowie actually was one of the reasons why I sort of left music journalism in a weird way. The way music was being presented with much and eventually much more music was it wasn't necessarily about the art and the craft and the music and the creativity. It was about, you know, who was sleeping with who in the business, who had cellulite, who's in rehab. It was all about the 10 second sound bite. Whereas I came from a background at much and and much more music too. What I brought with me to that network was the ability to create an hour special and let it breathe. Let the artist talk. Let's get inside their head. Let's learn things. Let's talk about creativity. Let's talk about you know the art. Uh, I came back with this amazing, brilliant David Bowie interview. It was like a forty-five minute interview that I was going to use towards an hour special that I was working on uh, about Bowie and his career. And my new boss at the time said, uh, David Bowie, I don't know if that's going to get ratings. What do you think? I think it's going to get ratings for an hour special. And I just remember thinking, oh, man, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I had a great time being a music journalist. And I don't think I can, I want to do it anymore if this is the way that our industry was heading. Bowie's also an example of one of these people that I've interviewed who I was a huge fan of, who later passed away. And as I get older, and I talk about this in the book, the concept of the reality of death, when I first started seeing some of my older interviews on TV being played because that artist died, uh, very emotional. 
and not oh. just for the passing, but to see that moment in time captured um, with me sometimes, well, all the time, talking to them. And that happened was Conway Twitty. And uh, yeah. Well, the next person, sadly, that I had on the list was Lisa Marie Presley to ask you about. Mm. And your screensaver. <laughs> it's on my computer if I collapse you right now. Just describe that, your screensaver. I was a fan of Lisa Marie. We're around the same age. So I remember seeing her when I was a little kid. And it looked like a little girl that I liked to play with at recess. We were the same age. And she was just, there's something about her. And I think she inherited her parents' brilliant, beautiful looks. So I always had a crush on Lisa Marie. And as an adult, got a chance to interview her. Uh, it was for her second record. And it was a live presentation on much more music where she would play with her band and then interview, play with her band and then another interview for like an hour in front of a live studio audience. And um, I did the introduction. She came out. She goes to sit down. So I waited to sit before she sat down. And she sort of like leaned into me a little bit. So I leaned back. We gave each other a little kiss. And then I sat back down, did the broadcast. I don't think it finally sunk in that I actually got to kiss Lisa Marie Presley until later that evening where I was at a pub uh, by myself trying to get the adrenaline to come down from that broadcast. And uh, yeah, I've just always had a love a love and respect for her work. Of course, I, I loved her dad. Always a big Elvis fan. And I could imagine how difficult it was for her to step out from that shadow. Mm -hmm. And um, her music, I don't think, ever sold millions and millions and millions of albums i think she did find an audience that was loyal and she did sell some albums and um i thought her music was brilliant i thought she was a great songwriter uh she dealt with some things throughout her life that um i think most people couldn't have handled who knows what she died from officially i don't know um but yeah just a sad sad loss but i'm reminded of lisa marie presley every day when i'm at my computer yeah, because there was this moment captured in time where, yeah, it's beautiful. Another quote from your book. In my career, I have been asked quite often who was one of my favorite interviewees. I always cite the Manchester, England band Oasis. Mm. Why Oasis? First of all, I love the music. A lot of people said, well, they were just Beatles ripoffs. No, they did it very well, though. There's a lot of groups that uh, they sort of Interesting thing about Oasis is they'll go into a song where you think, oh, what does that sound like? Oh, me, oh, Neil Young. Oh, no, it sounds like T-Rex. Oh, no, that one sounds like the Rolling Stones. Oh, that one sounds like the Beatles. But then they take it somewhere else. They pull it back and take you on this journey somewhere else where there's hints of other artists in there. But if you've ever seen Oasis live, man, they kick ass. Liam, the singer, is a larger than life personality. Um, some might say he's a bit of a hooligan. Uh, he, I got a hug from him last time I interviewed him. I've inter been interviewing the boys for years and have always walked away with a brilliant interview. And so I, I can't say anything bad about them. I understand there's some interviewers that are afraid of Liam. The boys won't be interviewed together. Well, they've no. broken up very sadly. But Liam and Noel will never be interviewed together. And this stems from an interview that happened in the UK when they first started out, where they actually started fighting and they agreed to never be interviewed together. And um, yeah, just one of my favorite bands, sonically, musically too. Uh, when they come on my MP3 player, I tend to drive a little faster, <laughs> which is not good. Yeah. You're listening to the County Rights to County Reads. I'm Lynn Dickering, and my guest is Bill Wolitschka, for many years on-air host and producer at Vogel CKW of Kingston, and now author of his biography, A Happy Has Been. Bill, after leaving much more music, you landed in Edmonton and then in Ottawa. You write very openly about suffering from depression or depressive periods since you were very young. Can you talk about those times, particularly after you were fired from the Ottawa station and you write, I was entering another very dark period. I would say it was one of the worst years of my life. Yeah, I have no problem admitting depression. I think the more people do, uh, the more we talk about it, the more there's less stigma associated with it. And like I said earlier, there are people that deal with depression who are multi 
millionaires. They have beautiful jobs, seemingly a perfect life. People that might surprise you that deal with depression. And uh, I describe it as a little dark cloud that comes to visit. And I look at it this way. If you can visualize your hands up at the same level, most people that don't deal with depression sort of exist at this level. People with depression, the way I look at it, sort of exist here emotionally, physically, uh, socially. And all antidepressants do is bring you up to a normal level. It doesn't put you through the roof. It's not like cocaine where, you know, you're buzzing and everything is beautiful and every, you're in a great mood. No, it just brings you up to a normal whatever normal is level of existence. And I'm not a doctor, I can't prescribe medication, but I know what works for me. And I've recognized it in other people and have talked them down the road to go talk to a doctor. Uh, if you are feeling these things and, um, you know, it's what, it's what I do to survive every day. And that's take my antidepressant every morning when I get up in the morning and it's part of my life. And I it was like, I've accepted that. And there were times where I thought, oh, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling normal again. I don't need it. And then I'll stop taking it. And within a few days, it's like I'm dragging my ass. Like I said, emotionally, physically, socially. And I realize that black cloud has come to visit again. And it can manifest itself in some ways with some people with maybe drinking or addictions or suicide when things become so bleak and you think there's no way out. But there is a way out, out of it. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not an oncoming train. So do talk to your doctor if anything that I'm saying does register to you and sounds familiar. But uh, yeah, that year, I wasn't fired. Oh, that sorry. station in Ottawa, <laughs> by the way. Big difference between being fired and laid off. Okay. I was packaged out. There were numerous cuts to that station two years before me, a year before me, or just before I was packaged out, there were some more layoffs. There were some layoffs that happened after me. There are still laying off people, I understand. All I've ever done was work, work in television. And all of a sudden, there's a whole other story uh, why I think I was laid off. It's in the book. I really don't want to get into it now. No. But um, yeah, around the same time of my year package, I was packaged for a year, which meant I couldn't work for an extended period of time, a non-competition clause, it's called. They don't want to get rid of me, give me a year salary, and then I show up across the street three weeks later. And it's all legalese and stuff, yeah. but uh, about a month after I was let go and packaged out, and it was horrible. I had friends constantly coming in to check up on me because all of a sudden I wasn't working when that's all I've ever done and love working. Love it. I, I need it when I get up in the morning to go to work. I'm sort of lost on the weekends, not knowing what to do. I love work. But anyway, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and uh, slowly died throughout that year. She lived in Barrie. So I used that opportunity to drive because uh, I had all the spare time to drive from Ottawa to Barrie to visit my mom in the hospital. And uh, about a month uh, a month and a half after she passed away, I got a job in Kingston uh, at CKWS TV, the global affiliate, which I did my research and found out it was this heritage TV station that had been around at that point for almost 60 years and uh, really ingrained in the community, which I loved. And uh, so, yeah, it was a it was a bad year. And thankfully, looking back now, Things happen for a reason. I know it's a tired cliche, but you don't really know it at the time, why things are happening and the way things are going down. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't be here without that layoff happening in Ottawa. And uh, that's the way I look at it now. And very fortunate, actually, that I was laid off when I think about it. Well, I want to talk about the tragically hip of course we started this conversation with a foreword from your book read by paul langua you became very close to them very close to to gord downey tell me about that concert in kingston and you were the mc the city asked me to mc the public screening at springer market square it was an estimated 22,000 people maybe gathered at Market Square from all over, not just Canada, but I met people from the U.S. as well, who wanted to be in Kingston for the special day with which would eventually be the hip's final show, as we know. Yeah, it was it was uh, an honor 
to be associated with them in that way to host people from all over North America to this, I'm not going to say party, but to the celebration. I don't think a day like that ever existed in Kingston. I don't think a day like that will ever happen again where this air hung over the city, uh, uh, a feeling of joy, a feeling of sadness, a feeling of celebration, a feeling of ecstasy, and a sense of saying goodbye and thank you to this band that has touched so many of us over the years. Uh, that all we could do is just say thank you. Thank you so much for the music. Thank you for what you've done for communities across Canada. Thank you for elevating people with your music and goodbye as a collective unit. But yeah, my relationship with the boys goes back to the mid nineties when I first started interviewing them. And I can talk about the hip now and honestly say, I'm a fan first and foremost. Interviewing them and becoming friends with them is a byproduct of what I did. I'm fortunate enough uh, to do what I've done for so long. That's interviewing rock stars. And um, more than the hips music, though, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, the guys have been blessed with characters and with an essence that surrounds them all. And that is they are a gift from God to the planet, I think. They are beautiful people. There's a bond that I have never seen in a band between the five members before that is so strong. And they let us into this world with their music and how grateful we should be to that. And so, yeah, just eventually moving to Kingston and, you know, running into Gord Sinclair, or Rob Baker, or Paul Langlois at different events and uh, becoming friends with their families as well, which is important to me. I'm very fortunate to be in Kingston when all this was happening with the Tragically Hip because it, it renewed my love in this band and certainly was, uh, you know, a beautiful thing to experience from the outside, like everyone else, just feeling that beauty and feeling that love for our boys, for sure. I want to end, uh, Bill, with you reading a short excerpt, but before we get to that, Partial proceeds from your book will go to the White Ribbon Campaign and various women's shelters across Canada. Why did you decide on that particular cause? I've been a member of the uh, White Ribbon Campaign since the late 90s. And not really, when I say member, anyone can be a member. Um, it's a state of mind that I think that you embrace. And that's basically, it's men coming together to end men's violence against women. I am see the White Ribbon concert uh, for many years in Toronto, a benefit concert. And basically it's guys going into schools in some cases, grade schools, university levels, talking to guys about empowerment, talking to guys about breaking down stereotypes about masculinity and instilling in them a sense of respect and love and adoration for females and the idea little johnny in grade three sees daddy slap mommy grows up with the belief that that's normal and a cycle has to be broken and so these guys go into schools they talk to little johnny they talk to young people about breaking that cycle giving young minds an alternative reality and hearing another voice and i just i really dig that and uh so yeah proceeds from the book are going to go to the white ribbon campaign fascinating organization because it started in canada shortly after the montreal massacre like cold polytechnique it started in toronto and then it went across canada slowly chapter started forming in the u.s and now it's recognized in over i think around 80 countries around the world where a lot of countries don't even have women's rights and there are guys in these countries standing up for women's rights. And uh, I think what a beautiful existence uh, to be a man and have a voice and speak on behalf of women. And uh, that sounds a little like, well, women can't do it themselves. And I don't mean for that to come across that way. No, but I think we need guys to start talking to other guys. You know, there's still problems with equity and equality that uh, needs to be addressed. And guys need to stand up and take a positive position and be vocal about it. Your book is titled A Happy Has Been. And I'm going to ask you to read that short excerpt towards the end of the book, which I think explains the title. Can you read it? A happy life to me means being proud of the job I currently do. 
to be living in a city I love and to feel the warmth from that city. I love feeling that I contribute in some sort of minor way to making this world a better place. I need to go to bed feeling exhausted from giving my all and I need to wake up refreshed and ready to do it all over again. I now know a happy life means being loved and giving love. Thank you, Amanda. I'm probably the world's first husband who is loving life and is grateful for everything they have. Thanks very much, Bill. It's been great to meet you and talk to you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, it means a lot to me that anyone wants to hang out and talk and ask questions. So thank you so much, Lynn. It does mean a lot to me. And uh, I'm not sucking up to you, but I love the county. Love it. <laughs> we all do. Thank you. <laughs> I've been speaking to Bill Walichka. Now, we've just barely scratched the surface of the stories Bill has to tell. You can read more in his autobiography, A Happy Has Been. It's published by Friesen Press. You heard Bill describe his friendship with the tragically hip. He was host and MC as many thousands gathered in Springer Market Square to watch the hip's final concert broadcast on CBC TV, August 20th, 2016. He was also the MC on February the 2nd, 2017, when Kingston Mayor Brian Patterson and the hip's Paul Langlois and Rob Baker unveiled a commemorative brick in the square. The stone displays the date of the Tragically Hip's final show and the lyric, everybody was in it for miles around, from their song, Blow It High Dough. That's the Tragically Hip and Blow It High Dough. Gore Downey died on October 17, 2017, and Mayor Brian Patterson released a statement which read in part, Gord was more than just a great musician. In Kingston, he was part of our family. He and the rest of the band members have given back so much to our city over the years, and I am thankful for the great memories we have of Gord. The sense of community and gratitude that was felt across Kingston as the tragically hip returned home for their final performance was incredible. It's something we will all cherish together. And that's it for this edition of The County Writes, The County Reads. My thanks to Bill Wolitschka, and special thanks to Paul Langlois of The Tragically Hip. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Lynn Pickering. Hope you can join me every Sunday at noon following the weekend update on 99.3 County FM, the voice of the county.